too much in, into the nitty gritty. Um, so first uh, uh, from here we have uh, Fash Sawyer, who's a director of the Value Creation Group for Actis, which is a leading African-focused private equity fund. Uh, Mary Gormley, Managing Director, Sub-Saharan African Depository Receipts for BNY Mellon, the leading provider of, of depository receipts, particularly for African issuers. Um, Harry David, uh, Board Member for AG Leventis, a, a Nigerian uh, conglomerate listed on the Nigerian Stock Exchange with businesses across foods, real estate, automotive and other industrials. Um, Miguel um, Azevedo, head of, Africa, uh, head of Investment Banking Africa for Citi, uh, which is a particularly strong franchise in African capital markets. Um, Haruna uh, Jallo um, uh, Waziri, Executive Director, Capital Markets for the Nigerian Stock Exchange. And finally, Tom Attenborough, Head of International Business Development, Primary Markets for the London Stock Exchange. Uh, welcome all. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, um, Miguel, turning to you, uh, we've heard um, from speakers already and, and I think a, a very helpful presentation from PwC about the difficult period recently for Nigerian issues. How do you see the current state of, of equity markets for such issues? Yes, um, good morning everybody. Um, I think there's clearly a, a, a resurgence in, in interest. We, we have seen on the debt market, we have seen the sovereigns coming back to the market, uh, and this is Nigeria, but in, in fact across the continent. Uh, we have seen since then the banks, the Nigerian banks have come to the market, uh, four of them by now. We have seen corporates and Pan-African and Nigerian corporates, so there's clearly uh, more interest there. <coughs> What we now need is, is a successful um, equity transaction in the market. There is a, a, there is a good proxy uh, that just happened. Uh, I, I will mention one that we worked on. Um, and this was Unilever Nigeria. It went very smoothly, a significant rights issue. Uh, and obviously we are all waiting in, in every um, panelist before mentioned the need for, um, the need for a, a successful IPO. Uh, soon. Um, in Nigeria, uh, there are a few uh, that are bound to come. Uh, uh, everybody is talking about <coughs> MTN Nigeria because it's effectively, if you want, it, it can play the role that privatizations played in, in other markets in the past, a very strong brand name, household name. Uh, we believe that may happen in 2018. Uh, and, and, and I think that that can be the transformational transaction. Um, I believe there will be, in 2018, uh, quite a few large IPOs out of Africa because, uh, as always, you need demand, but you also need uh, supply. And let me touch on the supply first. Uh, it is very visible now that there are a few companies willing to come to the market. Uh, and those are very strong names, uh, very strong stories with very strong numbers. And I think it's exactly the kind of profile we need to have the market taking off. On the demand side, um, I think um, there's international and domestic demand. On, uh, the international demand, it, it is driven by macroeconomics, is driven by sentiment. And I think things are lining up. Obviously, the, the improvement in macroeconomics in Nigeria play a big role. But I think overall, Egypt is also helping uh, what's happening in Egypt. But let me focus on the domestic <coughs> side, which I think is critical. And just one point, and, and using some of the data that was presented in, in the previous uh, panel, uh, that particular presentation then by PwC, which I think actually was a very good one. Um, and um, the PFAs in Nigeria. This, I think, is the critical element to have a proper market working. And I think there is interest when you talk to the managers of those pension funds. There is, which is absolutely normal in, 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 a, in a new market that is coming back. There are some structural rigidities in, in, in the regulation that need to be addressed, uh, namely in terms of uh, on what sort of uh, shares they can invest, what sort of uh, history those companies have in terms of profits and dividends. And I think we need a, a, a somewhat more relaxed framework without you know, being too relaxed, of course. We are talking about pension funds. But that is, I think, uh, 
what is uh, missing and what will be critical uh, in the future. Let me stop here. Okay. Um, but I think then turning specifically to, to issues um, themselves, um, when they're thinking about coming to, to market, which, which do you think is going to be more important for them in, in attracting and executing a successful IPO? A strong equity story or good corporate governance? Uh, you, you need both. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, there's no, no, no choice here, no choice, absolutely no choice. What I would say is that sometimes it's easier to have a great equity story than a great governance. Okay. Uh, the equity story doesn't depend on you, it depends on what we've seen before, you know, demographics, uh, economics, uh, urbanization, we all know those buzzwords. Governance impacts you and that needs to come from you. And, 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 and the very day you do an IPO, even if you sell 2%, it's not your company anymore and you have to behave like that. I think people understand. Some people want to do it, some people don't want to do it. It's very respectable. But I think people now understand that if they want to do it, they need to do it that way. And I think uh, 2018, and that's why I, make a, I also made a point that <clears throat> the kind of companies that we are seeing coming to the market, they tick those two boxes in a very, very nice manner. And I think that's what we need to get it uh, really happening. Thank you. Uh, and Harry, um, as a as a board member and shareholder in a, a Nigerian listed company, you know, again, corporate governance for this, we, we you know, it's a bit like describing an elephant. You know, you know it when you see it, but but it's actually very difficult to get down to it. From the inside, how do you go about you know proving to investors that that you know the business is well run and, and you know has effective corporate governance? Um, I happen to be on uh, the board of two listed companies, so one is Better Glass and one is AG Leventis, different uh, characteristics each. And I used to be on the board of Nigerian Bottling Company, which was taken private in 2011. Um, one common characteristic, <coughs> and I think it's valid, is that uh, your corporate governance is only as good as your board members are. Um, as, far, as far as rules are concerned and laws, I think uh, rules and laws in Nigeria governing uh, also, the stock exchange, I think, are as, are as good as anywhere. Um, so I would say, and uh, and having said that, we ha one of our businesses has less than 10% free float, going to what uh, Miguel just said, and uh, you know the our, our our behavior as a board at, uh, is the same whether we have 2% or 10% or 50% uh, um, investors. Uh, so I would say. Uh, corporate governance, in my mind, is uh, is the least of issues with, uh, with the companies on the stock exchange, as long as you have the right members on there. Um, more important are some other issues that you touched upon. I think. Uh, well, and and one which which um, I think probably is important is liquidity. And then with a with a small free float or otherwise, you know, the bigger free float, the bigger a company you have, the better liquidity you have. Do you think that, that the Nigerian Stock Exchange is providing sufficient liquidity for, for domestic issuers? Uh, our experience is that, um, that uh, let's say, link up with or parallel listing possibly with a bigger stock exchange might help that. We have not been able to find the liquidity. Uh, so we, our business were listed in the early 70s when we were, well, there was an indigenization program at the time. So. A number of shares had to be in the hands of uh, Nigerian shareholders, and we did that. Um, and uh, it worked only for a couple of years. After that, every time we had the rights issue, uh, the major shareholder, which is my family, ended up being the only, um, but almost the only participant. Um, and hence, us going back, you know, going back from 40 or 60 percent of the shareholding back up to 80, 90 percent, <laughs> which made it very difficult to to justify a listing. Um, and liquidity has been has been an issue, um, but uh, I, I think it the, there should be ways to with a link. You know, if you make flows of money easier, I think flows of money into and out of the country can facilitate new sources of uh, of investors to come and and, and support a something like the Nigeria Stock Exchange. Okay, I, and I'll, I'll come to Mary about facilitating you know, flows in. Um, but Fash, you know, as, a, as an investor, you know, primarily around private equity, but, but also investing into, into public markets, 
how do you see an ability, you know, how do you determine who you're going to invest in? You know, how, how do you make that investment decision that, that you're going to put your you know, uh, members' money in, into, the, into these businesses? Uh, and just to clarify, this is, this is whether it's a listed company or whether yeah. it's, it's private. Yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so, you know, Actus is a, uh, a global uh, private equity fund manager, you know, focusing on growth, growth regions of the world, so Africa, Asia, Latin America primarily. Uh, and we've been investing in Africa in particular for, for quite a long time. Um, when, we, when we look at what sorts of companies to invest in, I mean, I, I could give the kind of high level answer, which I will now, but there's obviously lots of detail in terms of due diligence that you would do on any specific company. But overall, you know, we're looking for companies that are well governed. That's very important. Um, we're looking for good management teams that are running those companies. We're looking for companies that have you know, competitive advantage in whatever sector that they're operating in. And we're looking for companies that are operating in sectors that have strong underlying uh, you know, thematic growth, you know, either driven by, as Miguel said, you know, uh, demographics or you know, changes in consumer uh, uh, patterns and behaviors and so on. But we like companies that have a secular, strong kind of growth tailwind behind them. Uh, and in the case of actors specifically, because we are operating, if you like, at the sort of uh, at, at the larger end of the deal size spectrum, the, we're also talking about companies that are well established, that are, that are that have achieved you know meaningful scale and have a good financial track record behind them. Mm -hmm. So that, those would be the main factors that, that we would look at, whether whether it's a public or a private company. Okay, um, and then uh, I, I, again. In terms of uh, looking into Nigerian capital market growth, do you do you see a, um, a substantial demand for you to be putting additional money into into NSE listed um, stocks? Um, in terms of investing into list, listed companies in Nigeria, um, it, it's it's mixed. Again, it's it's it's, it's situation specific. Um, but in general, we've we've tended not to invest in in, in you know, taking shares in listed companies in Nigeria for various reasons. You know, sometimes there isn't the there isn't the availability of large blocks of shares to be to be acquired. Uh, it could be a situation where, from from our perspective, you know, we w we don't feel that by taking a, for example, a minority stake in a listed vehicle that we, you know we can deploy the sort of activist investor strategy that we typically would like to on the private side so in general we haven't seen a lot of those opportunities in in the very uh, very recent times but that doesn't that doesn't say that we wouldn't look at it we'd certainly be open to looking at investing in in um in listed companies i mean let me let me answer the other side of the equation which i think may, may be of interest which is as we look to exit our investments you know, our privately held investments you know we absolutely see the ipo as a very interesting and incredible way to exit our investments. But we've done this recently in a number of markets. So we recently IPO'd uh, a utility business in, in Uganda and Kenya. Um, we've recently listed you know, on the Cairo Stock Exchange a snack food business, Adita Foods. Um, and indeed, we participated in a London Stock Exchange listing of, uh, of an Egyptian uh, diagnostic uh, company. So, so we certainly think it's a very interesting way for us to exit our investments. We haven't done any listings in Nigeria in recent times. It's something that we are certainly looking at very hard right now for some of the reasons that have been spoken about. It looks like the, uh, it looks like the environment and the climate in Nigeria may be shifting and may be more favorable. Um, but, but it's certainly, uh, for us, a, a viable strategy. And I think the main, I would just summarize by saying, you know, from a private equity investor point of view, there are a few things that we need to have in place to be able to sort of get comfort in, in pursuing a listing. I mean, you know, the first one is, do we think we can get better value, better valuations in the public markets than, than through a private sale? And then the second big element is liquidity, right? Is there sufficient demand, sufficient liquidity uh, for us to be able to, you know, you know, monetize the full extent of our investment? Um, and then beyond that, you get into more technical issues. You know, how complex is the process going to be? How high are the regulatory barriers? Um, are there technical constraints? such as you know, long lock-up periods, such that you can only realize your investment over multiple years. 
Um, and, and, and then in Nigeria specifically, there's always been the issue of are you, as a US dollar fund investor, are you going to be able to actually get your Naira proceeds and be able to actually you know, change them into dollars and get them offshore? And I think, I mean, I'm sure that will come up in more detail in the conversation. It looks like the, the environment on that particular point is, is much better than it's been in the last few years. But those are, the, those are the main factors, I think, that would, would, would give us comfort to move, move forward with the listing. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you. I mean, that's telling. I mean, Mary, you know, we know that you know, Nigerian companies and uh, issues previously had to negotiate various restrictions when accessing capital markets. How have you seen that eased, and you know, how are you helping you know, the easing of that process? I think what you're um, referring to are some of the, I guess, yes, technical restrictions that there were 10 or so years ago for Nigerian corporates looking to access international capital markets, and that was particularly around the use of CCIs, well known, I'm sure, to everyone in this room, certificates of capital importation, which are required as an investor in Nigeria in order to um, repatriate any, any gains uh, or indeed your initial um, investment. Um, also completely critical for um, the issuer, the investors, in um, a foreign issuance, so be that a set plats um, coming to London via um, the DI structure, depository interests, or indeed GT Bank or Zenith Bank or, or UBA uh, and various others um, accessing London through the depository receipt structure, which is what we we manage. Um, so it's a it, you know all very much. Um, now uh, fully functioning, but a very classic um, new, let's say, kind of new market um, from an international um, perspective, i.e. a market coming to the international markets for, for the first time. Um, we needed to work with the central bank. Um, we worked with our, our partners at Stanbeck to come up with a structure, the master CCI, we don't want to get into too many technical details, but essentially a structure that matched the CCI process with um, the mechanics of the cross-border trade um, and specifically London to ensure that um, what we're all talking about today and what we as a depository bank focus on liquidity specifically the smooth functioning of equities moving from A to B in this case Nigeria to London um, work without any hindrance and any barrier and, and yes 10 years ago that that was all resolved under this master CCI structure which is now used by set plats as well as all the other DR listings. And, and coming to that, um, you know, <coughs> with, the, with the, the efforts that were done on the SEPLAT listing and the links between the Nigerian and London Stock Exchange, and I'll, I'll come to Tom and Haruna a bit more on that, um, do you still see a role for the use of depository receipts for Nigerian issues when accessing London rather than you know, going straight through on a, a share listing process? Yes, um, we're a little biased, but we do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think we, um, we do. At the end of the day, Depository receipts, well, they've been around for almost 100 years now, but the, the sole function and sole purpose, the, the reason that they were created 100 years ago and the reason that they're still used um, pretty much as a cross-border settlement mechanism of choice, generally speaking, is because they still, um, Nigeria included, um, have the potential to ensure, as I said again, that efficient liquidity between the two markets. Um, now local market issues around CCIs, FX, et cetera, et cetera. Um, aside, there's nothing really that a DI versus an ordinary share versus a DR can do particularly to support that. But it, it's very fundamental. Um, what the DR simply is, is shares sitting in Nigeria in our custody account in, in our name and the depository's name. Um, and us issuing, the depository bank issuing DRs off the back of it whenever a deposit is made in, in this case, Nigeria, or conversely, when we receive shares in, in London. Point being, this is completely <coughs> electronic, it is very, very quick. That particular part of the process, and again, I'm going to leave aside CCIs and, and other local market elements, um, can be done in a matter of minutes or hours. So it, it's very, very efficient. The other thing that DRs offer, which no other cross-border option or, or um, does, um, be that ordinary shares or depository interest, is the ability to use a ratio. Um, very, very simple but quite effective. Just means that instead of being as an issuer, particularly um, we're looking at an IPO, instead of being constrained around the local price um, that you have in your home market, Nigeria, as we all know, typically a much, much lower usual kind of price per share, as you'd see in a London, certainly in the States, which is one of a big DR market for us. 
um, you use a ratio. So your IPO is priced at a level that is in line with the market, the international market that you're looking to access. It's pretty useful at the time of IPO. It's extremely useful when it comes to secondary market trading. Again, liquidity. Um, so these are two key elements of the DR um, that mean that, yes, it is. We, we, we continue to believe. And, and yeah, um, I mean, we have only one true ordinary share um, that I'm aware of uh, example in Nigeria, um, where Owando is obviously listed uh, still uh, in Nigeria um, and also on the JSE. That listing, the JSE listing, has never uh, taken off at all. One of the main reasons for that is that is an ordinary share listing. Um, and what that means is, not dissimilar to the DI, um, but a, a little bit less efficient, you have two registrars in each market. The process is very, very complex to move from A to B. In the one of those cases, it's taken four or five weeks to get from Nigeria to LFM, yeah, to JSE, and, and that's been very detrimental to the success. Which, again, is something that we seem to have solved in uh, London and, and Lagos. So, I think, again, let's not go back to those bad old days, um, I suppose. And Haruna, I mean, one of the things that, that Fash mentioned is is uh, opportunities and and finding the right the finding the right company to invest into. Uh, how does the NSC help you know uh, identify and and bring uh, issues to, uh, to market potential issues to market? What what, what support can you provide to these people to to you know, management shareholders ahead of a listing? Um, thank you. I'm glad uh, Fash talked about uh, his uh, uh, thinking around the IPO. Uh, in Nigeria, and one of the ways we do it is, for example, is uh, we've had several meetings with, with uh, fashion on his portfolio, and and um, those are the kind of things we do. But let me walk back a bit and, and try and explain the way the exchange works from a uh, new issues uh, listings and all of that. So, for example, what we've done is, in terms of capacity within the exchange, we began to hire what I call investment bankers or investment banker like you know uh, people who go out there and, and talk to issuers. So we partner with the intermediaries significantly. Uh, Miguel is here, we talk to Miguel all the time. On, on, for example, one transaction that I had mentioned, MTN, uh, from start to finish, um, where they are handholding <coughs> both the intermediaries and the potential issuers in terms of how we think there should be a smooth transition from what they want to do to what the market can offer to what regulation is about. Um, essentially to make that you know, process as simple, as clear as possible, and also to facilitate in terms of uh, assisting them in what we think is the right way to go in, a, in order to be able to uh, come through the regulation. So um, we, we, we see ourselves from you know, a, a partnership perspective than, than an exchange where we built a moat around ourselves and say, you know, knock on the door, drawbridge comes down before you get in. It's more of the fact that the door is already open um, we would work hard to go meet you if necessary. Uh, these are the ways we think you should, you know, come on board to the um, to the exchange. The key to all of this is also advocacy. Um, we we have gone big in the last two years in terms of advocacy uh, in support of our companies, both listed and potential ones that are going to be listed. We believe that um, policymakers sometimes would have to understand the needs of these companies via our own channel of communication with them. Um, and uh, also from a liquidity perspective, uh, Levendis has mentioned something like that. One of the things we've done from an advocacy perspective is collaborate with, um, um, like the central bank, for example, in terms of ensuring that there's liquidity uh, for our investors when they come from offshore and also exiting at the same time. Um, so we look at it from hand-holding in the beginning, uh, policy in terms of regulation from the SEC perspective to make it easier for them if possible, rule writing in our own perspective, uh, and more importantly is that, that we should try and create some kind of liquidity for them. Now, talking about liquidity, I know that question has not come up yet, probably will come on. Um, if you look at the WFE report in terms of liquidity over the last one year, up to September, I think it was a half year, the Nigerian Stock Exchange actually has uh, outscored EMEA standard in terms of averages, line by line, from you know, large cap to mid cap to the only uh, area I think where we're actually falling behind is for the small companies, um, growth companies if you like. We haven't done much around that and I think the central bank governor had mentioned that you know, uh, there is need for us to look at that market. But you know, if you look at Africa generally, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very small market compared to you know, uh, the, the other markets. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gradual <coughs> process. It's improving every day in terms of processes, in terms of 
you know, ensuring that investors are well protected, you know, the governance is there, uh, and we hope that that should be able to facilitate. And I think Oscar really has some numbers earlier today uh, in the morning. Um, we've seen liquidity improve by about 80% from year to date. We've seen the market jump in terms of valuations. We have seen, you know, issuers do secondary listings. We like to see more IPOs. I mean, we're talking about MTN. MTN should be a game changer for our market because of the size of it, and then because we think follow-ons will come in from from that as well. So, by and large, yes, it's not as liquid as you want it to be. Is it improving? Yes. Can it be better? Yes. Will it be better? I strongly believe so. So, um, again, people talk about <coughs> listings and liquidity. When I go to an issuer, what he wants is good valuation, and why others not listing? If I go to an investor, he's saying you don't have liquidity. Why are you not getting listed? So, you know, you have to balance those two at the same time and make sure that, you know, um, you provide that platform, but on a gradual and sustainable basis before you uh, ensure that you, you put the two together. And, and I think that's, that's important. And, and again, you know, obviously it ties up with, uh, with London, but, but clearly you know, having the Nigeria Stock Exchange as an attractive platform for international investors without the need for an international listing you know, of the company itself, I think is going to be important in terms of attracting additional liquidity. And that advocacy is going to need to come from the Nigerian Stock Exchange as much as from the, 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 the companies and the, the investment banks as, as well. Um, and I suppose you know, you're always going to be incentivized to try and keep as much of that you know, investor base within Nigeria rather than looking and pushing companies into a, into a dual listing. So, again, advocacy for us, uh, particularly for local companies, um, is very important, like I've mentioned earlier. Um, we believe that, you know, collaborations actually do work um, because we are all going to uh, go to the same issuers, we're all going to go to the same investors, um, and we're all going to go to the same policymakers for different advocacy. I remember when we started this partnership with uh, the London Stock Exchange. Ibuko and I sat down somewhere in Lagos, we were having a drink, and we defined the word called competition, which is uh, different from competition. Um, I, I would I we try to define and say, look, we will compete, but we will not compete. Um, and we will collaborate rather than compete. And we think that there is better value in both of us agreeing that, you know, ultimately we are going to the same issues in Africa. We are going to the same uh, um, policymakers for advocacy. Why don't we do it jointly so that we get both benefits and define the barriers as which we look. Um, at that time, I think the two CEOs were not sure of how we were going to work, but at least today, three years down the line, you can see what's happening. So I, I believe that, you know, competition is good, um, especially if you have a small market, and especially if you have partnership like with the LSC, which has been here, what, 200 years, or that about? So um, we're not adverse to it. Um, we will continue to do it so long as it works for us. And uh, if our companies are looking outward, then we have to follow them to look outward, you know. And, and for us, uh, so far it's working, and uh, let's see how it goes. Thank you. And, and again, Tom, I think that brings you on to the collaboration point in, in particular, mm. and, and you know, joining up with the Nigeria Stock Exchange as much as anything else. You know, making London the choice, uh, the first choice for international listings of Nigerian businesses. Um, I, and I suppose on a more technical basis, international um, listings, do you see a, a preference by, by investors here for a, a, an international, like a UK company with Nigerian assets, or are they comfortable with a Nigerian company you know, listed in, in London? Um, just on the partnership point first, um, I couldn't agree with Haruna's words more. I think it's been a, a fantastic example of, of uh, what can be done in a collaborative spirit. Um, you, you mentioned the fact that there's no drawbridge, the door's open. I think if you listen to Xavier speak for more than 30 seconds without him mentioning open access as being the philosophy of the London Stock Exchange, uh, I'd be very surprised. So um, I think it's been a fantastic partnership and, and just shown what we can achieve together. Um, and I, I think uh, the complementary nature of the investor bases we serve, the complementary nature of, um, uh, you know, of, 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 sort of market structures, uh, can ultimately, given, as you say, we've been talking to a lot of the, the same issuers and ultimately want to drive the best results, uh, you know, for those issuers uh, in the way we can, I think is um, is the root of, uh, of of every bit of that uh, partnership and, and cooperation. In terms of the, the point about structure, um, I'm not sure investors actually think like that. Um, I think that, um, you know, what they want is exposure 
to good quality equity stories with good quality management teams and a governance package around that that, that, that works for them. Um, clearly, on the one hand, uh, you know, any um, investor will have to weigh up opportunities which you know, may have sort of international style rap history, Western management, for want of a, of a better phrase, who may have slightly greater experience on the one hand, against local knowledge, um, against that sort of deep understanding of the domestic market you know, on the other. <coughs> I think there are, there's room for both investment strategies, to be honest. Um, I think both can be evaluated on their own merits, um, provided, of course, that, um, um, and I think we will see a lot more indigenous companies you know, coming uh, to market directly rather than international companies with, with Nigerian assets, I, I'm, I'm sure. Um, the governance piece, as has been said already, is, is very, very important. And I think, just to circle back to that initial question, I think if you could summarise that governance piece um, in, in, in one word, it's trust. And, and I think that is absolutely key, that um, investors ultimately trust the package that's being, being put in front of them. And that's not something often you can do at the time of an IPO in of itself. You need a run-up uh, to it. And I think, and, and we often um, spend our time talking about the, the, the way in which IPO practices have changed over the last few years. And I think probably one of the best byproducts of the financial crisis has been the fact that people have started IPOs earlier, uh, have got um, out in front of investors early, have got people comfortable with these governance package early, so you're getting fewer and fewer surprises uh, you know, at the end. Um, so I think that trust piece is absolutely key. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree. I mean, um, Miguel, you could comment more on this, but early look presentations, you know, pilot fishing, you know, and, and Mary equally you know, coming to see the DR um, far in advance. We used to think about an IPO process of, you know, you might be able to get it done in six months. We're, we're talking 18 months now, aren't we, for getting access into the international markets? That's for me, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you, you can be talking 18 and I, 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 even more sometimes, hopefully not, not, not that often. Uh, but I would say um, 12 to 18 uh, probably works. Uh, but but uh, as Tom was saying, and, and Tom being a, a former equity capital markets person knows this better than all of us, um, you have to de-risk. And when it comes to Africa and to Nigeria, this de-risking process uh, of an IPO is extremely important. Uh, and it's extremely important on both supply and demand. On demand, you have to bring those stories out very early understand what people uh, think of those. Maybe you have to change the, 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 uh, the, the story and the way you tell the story, uh, uh, but you have to give time for people to, to listen and to understand and, and go and do some of their own research. It's not, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's not easy to sell uh, African stories, let's be honest. So you need to do, to do all this. But it's also important on the supply side because you, you only have an IPO if there is um, a convergence of expectations. And on the supply side, uh, when companies meet investors, they, they understand uh, some of the things that uh, hopefully people like myself have been telling them for a while, but not necessarily uh, they have uh, taken on board. And so when they meet the investors, they understand. And, and again, on the governance side, for example, is very important. So, very, very important, and it takes longer, but you know, uh, we, we, it's the only way to get there, really. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, conscious that we were running over slightly beforehand, are there any questions uh, from the floor for um, our panelists? No, uh, so one final question um, from me to uh, Haruna. Um, collaboration you know, with London Stock Exchange, the development of the Nigerian Stock Exchange itself, where would you like to see the Nigerian Stock Exchange in the next five years? Well, um, first of all, we're mutual. Um, that limits uh, what we can do or cannot do. Um, so priority for us right now is to demutualize. Um, once we demutualize, as you know, you segregate ownership from trading rights. Uh, many times when we want to do certain things, that restricts uh, our capacity to execute those things. So it limits us in terms of uh, where we can go. Um, that fortunately is ongoing track, it's on track. 
uh, I believe the law to allow us to neutralize is at the final reading or something like that. Hopefully, we should get it out this year. Now, that will become a game changer for us. Um, once we're able to demutualize, then, you know, it's an unleashed uh, 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 graduate, if you like, going out there to do something. Um, secondly is that, you know, our product limitations, um, key to what we want to do is introduce derivatives. Today, uh, you can't hedge much in, in our markets. The pension funds keep asking for this product, um, and so we are developing that process. And in, within that is also a CCP, which we've just uh, uh, established. Uh, hopefully it should be a market-wide infrastructure uh, that would have all the trade points as well as some of the clearing members and some market participants to be able to make it look like it's a, well not look like, to make it a market infrastructure and everybody can come and participate in it. We think that should also be key to how we see ourselves in the future. But more importantly is our objective in terms of our strategy, where we should be. Um, key to it is that we want to be as close to South Africa as possible. South Africa has something near $900 million in terms of market cap. We're nowhere near that, We're about six, seven uh, uh, billion. So for us, maintaining that number two space and coming closer to, to uh, South Africa is very key. So that means more liquidity, more listings, a more broader market, and then you know, we can decide whether Ibuku wants to continue the competition or not. <laughs> but that notwithstanding, we'll keep it going and, and certainly we want to be out there, be a friendly market open to uh, uh, investors as well as listings, and then have all the PEs in Africa looking at Nigeria to actually IPO without coming to have a meeting with me like Flash does sometimes. Positive story. Just, just to, to add a, a couple of things to that, um, I think, and a lot's been said already about um, uh, the, the demand and the supply side. I think one of the things that, that you know we're very keen to do as part of our partnership um, is to help prepare companies for IPO in the right way at an earlier stage, give them that education, give them that mentoring, early stage advice, and frankly, make capital markets aspirational again uh, for many of these businesses. I think um, a combination of features over, over recent years, and this is not a Nigeria-specific question um, uh, issue, um, be it around regulation, uh, be it around perceived complication, perceived difficulties with disclosure and transparency, you know, public markets have had a bit of a rough time. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we, we need to really, from sort of grassroots upwards, um, with some of the exciting growing businesses, um, really work with them from a much earlier stage to show them the runway uh, as to what public markets can do uh, to support their long-term growth strategy. So part of that has been around uh, the Companies to Inspire Africa, uh, you know, publication I'm sure many of you would have seen and contributed to, uh, which we were delighted to, to have um, got underway, which I'm sure will be back again uh, in, in the next sort of 12 months, bigger and better. Um, if, in fact, on the road, the single, the single uh, question I've been asked more times than anyone else is, uh, is why am I not in it? <laughs> and so I think as, as the data set improves, uh, you know, we're looking forward to, uh, to, to getting that out and making it bigger and better. And, and programs like Elite as well, um, that again, support companies at an earlier stage, which um, I think is really, really important um, uh, you know, to say, make, make markets aspirational again for young, exciting SMEs, which are really the lifeblood of the economy, not just in Nigeria, but everywhere around the world. Okay. Well, thank you very much, um, Fash, Mary, Harry, um, Miguel, Haruna, and Tom. Uh, very uh, helpful and insightful information. And we're very happy. It just means more work for the lawyers. So um, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.